you love wilderness, you have to love Australia. I mean, take a look at it. It's vast. It's a beautiful continent. I'm going to venture into the heart of some of the wildest places on Earth. Across the remote outback. Oh, what was that? Oh, a big one. Into the big blue ocean. And high over the mountains. Well, it should be a great place to look for eagles. Yeah. With my team, I'm going to discover the incredible life that thrives here in all its beauty and variety. I just saw one. This is one of the most incredible sights in nature. This is the Australian wilderness. I'm heading to an ancient forest, one of the last remaining wilderness areas on the planet. The Walpole Wilderness covers over three and a half thousand square kilometers in Western Australia. What a beautiful dawn. This is the southwest corner of Australia. I've never been here before and I'm really excited. That's the Frankland River making its way inland and you can see all around it this dense canopy of trees the Walpole Forest. This ancient forest is home to some of Australia's most majestic trees and oldest animals. I'm really excited to explore it. I'm certain that when I step into that forest, I'm going to be traveling back in time. My plan is to follow the Frankland River into the heart of the forest, and then to continue on foot to get close to some of its biggest trees. By tomorrow, I want to have reached Mount Franklin, a granite peak about 20 kilometers inland that rises above the treetop canopy. I'm starting out by my favorite means of travel, canoe. Oh, a nice piece of workmanship. Always a good moment when you sit in a, an unfamiliar canoe and test it for the first few moments. I like that very much. You get the feel, the personality of the boat. You can trace this forest's ancestry back almost 65 million years to a time when Australia was part of a vast landmass called Gondwana. When Gondwana drifted apart, her forests split across several different continents, including this corner of Australia. This is stunning. There's a real primeval quality here. I quite expect to see a dinosaur coming through this forest. It's got that real quality. And uh, I can see that these trees are huge. These are real giants. Since the dawn of time, this forest has provided shelter, food, and sustenance for the people who lived here. As I paddle further upstream, I can see trees ahead of me with all kinds of uses. This is called the peppermint tree. It's got that willow-like leaf. And if you take some of these leaves and you crush them up. <laughs> you get this incredibly powerful scent, volatile scent. It's a, uh, it's a cross between eucalyptus and peppermint. And this was used, the oils in this were used by native people as an antiseptic. Fascinating. Ten kilometers up the river, I meet up with local guide and conservationist Gary Muir. He's going to join me on the next part of my journey. How's it feel, Ray? It's beautiful. 
It's a lovely boat. Gary, tell me a little bit about the history of the river. This river here, it's a very ancient river, and this is one of those ancient river valleys. You're going into a valley that's been made, you know, millions and millions and tens of millions of years old. The Franklin River is deep for much of its course. For the early logging industry, this river was a perfect way to transport the huge trees from its banks all the way to the coast. When you look here, there's timber right on the water's edge with very, very deep waters, so they thought maybe we can utilise all this timber. What did they use them for? Much of the Jarrah from this area actually got helped build the London Underground and quite a few of the streets, for example, Regent Street is Jarrah yeah. from this area. Really? Mm. That's amazing. Jarrah is a very hard wood, and in Victorian times, it literally paved London's streets. This was because wooden cobbles were much quieter than those made from granite. Wow. Well, a bit of a jetty there. Uh, this is the monastery. This is such a special place. In 1910, a government party visited this area to assess it. They were so impressed by the beauty of the setting that they decided to preserve it from the logging industry, and instead, they declared it a national park. It got first called the monastery because a mist rose and it formed a ceiling and the waters went still like a highly polished floor and the carry trees appeared like pillars and it was like this magic of a monastery. And it was so special and quiet and peaceful that they decided that they would reserve this area. Well, I think this is where I'm going to leave you. Um, I'm going to jump out here, but it's been a real pleasure. All the best, Gary. Thank enjoy you. the wilderness. Take care. Wow. That's a great way to arrive in the forest. I need to get the circulation back in my legs, though, a little bit now before I take to the trail. I'm going to head away from the river, climbing towards some of the forest's oldest and most majestic trees. But there are some delightful tiny forest dwellers which catch my attention first. If you're not looking, it's easy to miss little fellows like this tree gecko, perfectly camouflaged against the bark of the tree. They're highly specialised climbers and forage in trees and shrubs for small insects and spiders. My route is taking me higher to a ridgeline well above the river valley. Well, it's quite a hike up from the river. In fact, you can see the river when you look back here, that's it snaking through over there. I'm searching for some of this forest's biggest trees. Wow! And I'm not disappointed. Fantastic. This is a red tingle tree. It gets its name from an Aboriginal name for the tree, the dingle dingle tree. And uh, believe it or not, this is just an average sized tree. Some of them can have a girth of 24 meters. This is a carry tree. That's one of the world's tallest tree species. In fact, if I look right up in here, you can see there's a dead branch up there. We call that a widow maker with good reason. In fact, that dead branch is the size of many mature trees in other parts of Australia. These trees are a species of eucalyptus. They've evolved to survive forest fires and can live to be hundreds of years old. They're evergreen and flower throughout the year, providing a constant supply of nectar to the forest's many and varied birds. This is a laughing kookaburra. Although named after its distinctive call, it's actually a kind of large kingfisher. I'm really starting to like this forest. It's full of surprises, like this cave. This isn't actually a cave at all. This, believe it or not, 
is the roots structure of a fallen tree. Amazing, isn't it? But the most amazing thing is that these trees are incredibly fast growing. So even this vast tree may only have been four or 500 years old. Right, it's time to find some more of Walpole's elusive wildlife. The dense undergrowth of this forest is perfect habitat for a very special creature I'm hoping to see, the quokka. It likes to feed at night, so as the day closes, I stake out a likely spot. I put this screen up, so I'm just going to use a little bit of cunning. I'm going to put some gloves on because the mosquitoes will be out in a few minutes. And uh, just sit tight, sit quiet, and hope for the best. and patience has its rewards. This is a quokka. You can see from its coat how it's dark and a little bit mottled. And that means it can disappear into the shadows of the sword grass under branches and be almost invisible. Coupled with that, it's virtually totally nocturnal, so this is a really lucky sighting. But this forest, this ancient forest, is one of their strongholds. And it's very fitting to see it here, because it's a very ancient marsupial, stretching right back to the days when all mammals were small. They've got a beautiful face, they've got these chubby little cheeks that make them very, very cute. In fact, Disney could not have invented a cuter character. It knows I'm here, I think it's listening to me talking about it. I'm exploring the giant forests of Australia's Walpole wilderness. Yesterday, I followed the Franklin River inland, and today I'm going to continue on foot into the heart of the forest to a granite peak called Mount Franklin. It's quite fun sleeping here. All through the night, you can hear animals scurrying around outside because, of course, most of the mammals here are nocturnal. So this morning, I'm going to go meet somebody who can show me what takes place after dark. Environmentalist Prue Anderson has been studying the diversity of the local wildlife. Well, it's a lovely morning, isn't it? It's gorgeous. Last night, she set up some trail cameras to record some of the forest's most secretive creatures. What have we got here then, Prue? So, we've got a motion camera. Yeah. Looking at this beautiful tingle habitat tree and We'll just see what we've got. We've got a possum, brush-tailed possum, last night. Oh, that's good, yeah. Very nice. Brush-tailed possums are tree dwellers and they're agile climbers. They come out at night to feed on eucalyptus leaves and forest plants. This one is probably heading home after dinner. You can see it running up the tree. Yep. All right, so... Now, what's that? That's a bandicoot, a southern brown bandicoot. Amazing. <laughs> Unlike his tree-dwelling neighbour, this little marsupial lives on the ground in shallow burrows. He uses his sensitive snout to forage for food on and beneath the forest floor. Scratching away. So that was digging up fungi? Yes. Have you seen any um, non-native predators on your trail cameras? I have. I've captured feral cats and feral foxes, which we've got a big problem with. It's important to know that they are here and they're doing, having a massive impact on the marsupials. We have a big problem with cats and they eat so many marsupials just in one meal. And birds, reptiles, they eat everything. 
Prue and I move on to check a second camera trap by a fallen tree. And we're in for a surprise. This log up ahead fell down about a fortnight ago. And you put a camera on there? Yep. So this tree's been dead for a long time. Yeah, hasn't it just? So last night, 3.30 a.m., there's a feral cat. Look at that. It's a big one. Yep. So this is not a pussycat, that's a wild cat. That's a wild cat. Yeah. We don't want that here. Nope. A feral cat is a domestic cat which has gone wild. Introduced to Australia by the first settlers, it's a super predator that has become a major threat to native wildlife. All right, let's see what else we've got. A mardo, and it's dashing around like a mad thing. <laughs> a mardo is a small mouse-like marsupial, and along with other small mammals like bandicoots and quolls, it's at great risk from feral cats, but not tonight. It survived the cat for tonight. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, that was a good... <laughs> Trail cameras usually don't get something quite as good as that. Yeah. It's great to know that conservationists like Prue are working to protect this forest's wildlife. But the morning is moving on, and it's time for me to head back on the trail, moving deeper into the forest. I'm following a time-worn track, probably an old Aboriginal path. Without it, this land would be impenetrable. This forest is incredibly dense. It's not just the thick undergrowth, it's the nature of it. Take a look at this, this is sword grass. And in the leaves of the sword grass, there's silica. And it has like a saw edge to it. If I take this bit of bark, you might be able to hear it. I'm using a bit of bark because if I ran my finger down there, I'd end up with a cut. But for people living in this forest, all these plants had a use. I'm excited to meet Joey Williams, an Aboriginal guide who joins me further up the trail. Hey, Joey. Nice to meet you. You too, mate. Joey grew up in these forests, and his knowledge has been handed down to him over the generations. Here, right? This is a soap bush. So we put that with water and crush it up. A bit of water, rub the hands up. together, and the leathers. Right, so we've got another little one here, right? This vine for fish. It's fish, like a net, isn't it? Fish net. Yeah. And they'd stick those in between the rocks as a yeah, the tide went out. Yeah. And they'd get trapped. And it's, it's strong, isn't it, as well? It's strong. It's very strong. Yeah. All right. Got this cage born here. Spearwood. Spearwood. That sounds good. Jerry's going to show me how his people made spears for hunting in the forest. All right, Ray. This is our, um, our burong. You probably know it as a grass tree. OK, so burong's your word for grass tree, yeah, the, yeah. the original word, yeah. So I'm going to get some of the resin out of this. This is what we're going to be joining the, the spearhead, the keech burong, the keech head with. Mm -hmm. And do you add anything to it? Yeah, a bit of yonga guna, kangaroo poo. Kangaroo, yeah, dung. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I'm with you. Yonga guna. I'm getting good at this. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Yonga guna, yeah. All right, I've got a little spot down here for us where we're going to start making these spears. That's a nice spot, look at that. That's quite a view, isn't it? Beautiful. So what, fire here? Fire here. Let's get organised, eh? Yeah, let's clear some of this away. All right, we're almost ready to get into these spears, eh? Yep. The first stage is to strip the wood completely of its bark. It's going to need a little bit of straightening. Yeah, we'll put him in the fire, straighten yep. him up. Heating the wood makes its fibres more flexible, so the spear can be straightened. I'm getting the feel of this piece of wood now. All right, so I'll grind up a little bit of this um, resin here for us, eh? Yep. 
Joe is passionate about keeping his traditions alive, so he's collected everything we need to make these spears from the forest, including the resin to glue it together. Rightio, now we get to our next stage. Wrap it in a bit of kangaroo tail sinew. Once it's dry, will you? I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty tough, you know? It dries like a plastic. How important is this traditional knowledge to you? I think a lot of Aboriginal people want people to know that we are a race of people too, you know? We're not just flora and fauna. We, we are a race of people. We have values, you know? We have strong family ties. We've got the oldest culture in the world. So we want to show people that, um, hey, this is the way it is for us. This is not you know, just a show, it's a way of life. We have to be careful, we could sound like two sad old men. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know I am. <laughs> well, that's gone on all right, that. Yeah, that's good. You've done this before. I have done it before, yeah. yeah. Well, why don't you pick me something hard for you to make? <laughs> <laughs> That's come out great. Well, right. you know, you, you, you can't take that one apart and leave it here, you know, you've got to take that home with you. I can't see that going through the customs, can hey? you, in this day and age? Oh, you'd be, you'd be dis <laughs> disrespecting me if you oh, leave it here. I've got to leave it here, mate. If I, hey? if I take that, they'll, they'll stick me in jail. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll take the knowledge with me, if that's yeah. all right. That's it, for sure. As dusk gathers, I leave Joey to complete the final leg of my journey. I'm climbing up the great granite peak of Mount Franklin, which towers above the forest. As I ascend, for the first time, I find myself above the tree canopy. Well, it's been quite a journey. If you look way back there, in the very far distance is the sea. That's where the Franklin River is. And this is Mount Franklin. I've come all the way up through the forest, but that's nothing. Take a look at this. Now that's what I call wilderness. Look, it seems to stretch on forever. <laughs> <laughs> 